Hi everyone, this is going to be a answer to a post or comment and uh, I wanted to make it as a sub episode of episode two. We just read or heard on Jesus' prophecies that protect us from Saul Paul and that particular prophecy was about the sign of the Son of Man prophecy. In this prophecy, I believe this is Yahweh through Jesus protecting us from Paul because he's going to tell us that the second coming of Christ has to be universally seen. And then if anyone says, behold, they've seen me in the desert or wilderness road, or they do not go forth and listen to them. Behold, he's in secret chambers or in a private room. Believe it not. And so Paul both is seeing allegedly the real Jesus on a road to Damascus eight chapters after the ascension, after we're waiting for Jesus to return from heaven for the second coming. Paul is claiming actually Jesus has appeared physically to him. In 1 Corinthians 15, he specifically says this is the same uh, level of appearance that the others had of the resurrected Jesus in the accounts of the 12 and Mary Magdalene. He puts himself in that list with them and then says, after the 12 saw him, I least of all saw him. And that is, by the way, play in his name, which is Pax Lilis in Latin, but that's a whole other story. Anyway, so um, that's the fact pattern we had in the last episode, too. And then I asked the question, why didn't Peter, uh, I said, Peter shows knowledge of the sign of, sign of the Son of Man prophecy, but yet he and the apostles don't seem to have ever put two and two together and said Paul's uh, uh, statements or beliefs are of a person who should know that he didn't meet the real Jesus if the sign of man prophecy applied. Well, apparently Paul doesn't say to them ever that he had a physical appearance of Jesus. He says it was a vision. And I want to show you where that is. So here is where in Acts 26, 19, Paul says in a testimony, court testimony, wherein, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, talking about these, the Damascus experience. But in the same text, the same uh, verses, a few verses earlier, he's calling it, he says, his own Jesus says, uh, uh, he says, uh, who are, Paul doesn't know who this is. He says, who are you, sir? He's curious, sir. And he said, I am Jesus. So this unknown person, says, identifies himself to Paul as Jesus, whom you persecute, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared unto you for this purpose. So if you look at the full context of Acts 26, you have this, what's seemingly contradictory, uh, that you can call it a vision, but this person appeared to you physically. And of course, Paul relates that the people with him heard the voice, but didn't understand the voice, saw the light, and so on. But Paul is clearly claiming this was not in his mind, it's not a vision. And so that's a misuse of the word vision. But Paul has that ambiguity in the way he talks. He uses it in a way that most people would think, no, a vision means something in your head. But Paul's using it for something you actually see. <laughs> and that's not how most people view the idea of a vision. You know, I had a vision in my dreams is what you really mean. But he doesn't mean it that way. And so that's what I uh, posited is likely explains why Peter, although he knows of the sign of the Son of Man prophecy, well, I'll show you again, he mistakenly doesn't ever advise Paul, you're you're lost, buddy. You've not met the real Jesus. He, he's assuming this was a vision of Jesus in his head. And I'll show you why. So let's first of all establish that Peter unequivocally had knowledge of the sign of Son of Man prophecies right there in Acts 3, verses 19 to 21. I call it uh, the sign of man prophecy of Peter. And this is his second sermon of Christianity. He's going to lead 5,000 people to Christ. These were the Jewish people who had been involved in helping agitate Pilate to kill Jesus, uh, probably instigated by the high priest, incidentally. And they're feeling sorry. So, you know, the there was a, a huge outpouring of repentance over that afterwards. And this is what uh, it says in verse 19. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. And they do so, by the way, and they all get baptized. Verse 20, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord and he may send forth the Christ. So the Lord there means God Yahweh, that he, God Yahweh, may send forth the Christ, the Messiah, having been appointed for you, Jesus, whom it is necessary that heaven receive until the times of restoration of all things of which God spoke through the mouth of his holy prophets from the past age. So uh, he's saying the Lord Jesus Christ cannot return until the times of restoration, a single appointment of a final point in time. And if you go back to Daniel 9, uh, verse 25 and 26, you'll see the Messiah is mentioned in each verse, and it's each about 
uh, his being the fulfillment of the Son of Man prophecy mentioned earlier in, I think it's Daniel 7, uh, who's commissioned to come to the world to take it back for God, basically. And there is the restoration of all things. So Peter knows of this, and he know he must know the conditions Jesus laid down in Matthew. Why doesn't he ever warn Paul? You, you can't have this happen. He can't come back in a second coming just to you and then come back in a third coming. No, there's only one next coming. That's that's exactly what Peter is saying right here, right? There's no multiple, uh, you know, bouncing up and down like, uh, you know, ping pong ball between heaven and earth until the final restoration of all things. So Paul would have received this warning had he said something other than the word vision. But we can prove that Peter had this understanding of vision by going to the Clementine homilies, which are the version of what we would call the Acts of the Apostles from the perspective of the original 12 and the Ebion. And this was actually a very well-loved work and read everywhere as the Acts of the true 12 apostles in, in uh, that era of the first century. Okay, so let's take a look at that again, which we quoted last time. All right, so here is what we did last time. We quoted this at length, and I'm going to receive a question about it, in particular where it says uh, we received instruction for one year from the master. So the time of Jesus' uh, instruction was only one year, according to Peter, and most of you have been told it's three years based on the fact that there are three Passovers in the book of John, and we'll get into that in a minute. And so he's going to ask me, can you help prove this to me? Okay, so we're, I'm now going to give the proof that I didn't digress into last time to give the more detail in this episode. So uh, New Advent is a Catholic web page, uh, Fathers of the Church, Clementine Homilies. But this is a work accepted within Protestant scholarship is actually the authentic or, well, I shouldn't say authentic, the original work by the Ebionites, which was revised by Rufinus to, uh, in the era of the Trinity, which the Ebionites were known as being anti-Trinitarian. So anything that would have been anti-Trinitarian has been uh, removed from this text. So you can take that for, uh, take that to the bank, but anything that was, uh, anti-Paul was also toned down by simply changing the name of the, uh, the antagonist from Paul to Simon Magus, but even the pro most hardline pro Pauline Protestant, uh, scholars like Roberts will tell you, of course, we know it's a cipher, uh, Rufin has had a cipher, a code, uh, like a hidden code that anytime you see the word Simon Magus in this work, it's really Paul. Okay. So this is regarding Paul and it's homily 17, chapter 19 of the Clementine homilies you see right here. So this is what it says. If then uh, Peter is talking to Simon Magus, Paul, and he's saying that you received your a commission from Jesus, supposedly by a vision with him. And this is what he says. If then our Jesus appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you, it was as one who was enraged with an adversary. And this is the reason why it was through visions and dreams or through revelations that were from without that he spoke to you. But can anyone be rendered fit for instruction through apparitions? And if you will say it is possible, then I will ask you, why did our teacher abide in discourse a whole year? That's the key issue in this question I'm receiving to those who were awake. And how are we to believe your word when you tell us that what that he appeared to you? And how do you, how did he appear to you when you entertained opinions contrary to his teachings? But if you were seen and taught by him and became his apostle for a single hour, proclaim his utterances, interpret his sayings, love his apostles, condemn not with me, who accompanied with him for in direct opposition to me, who am a firm rock, the foundation of the church, you now stand. If you were not opposed to me, you would not accuse me and revile the truth proclaimed by me in order that I may not be believed when I state what I myself have heard with my own ears from the Lord as if I were evidently a person that was condemned in a bad repute. But if you say that I am condemned, you bring an accusation against God who revealed the Christ to me and you inveigh against him who pronounced me blessed on account of the revelation. But if indeed you really wish to work in the cause of truth, learn from all, learn first of all from us, but we have learned from him and become a disciple of the truth, become a fellow worker with us. Okay, so what I mentioned is the fact that this uh, says a whole year actually is proof positive that this is an authentic work, because if you were corrupt, you would not know, if this is a corruption later in time, you would not know necessarily that there are two Passovers in a particular year uh, at the, around the same time each year, and that you would also, in a, that means in a one-year time frame, you would have the Passover from year, let's say, one, and then you go to the next year's Passover, and that's 12 months plus a day, let's say, to get to the next Passover. So you can have, in a 12-month, one-day period, you can have two Passovers, 
But at that time, there's a second Passover at the time. Uh, there is, it's called the Diaspora Passover, just so you know, but it's a second Passover that is celebrated and uh, flares go up over Jerusalem to tell people when to do this, that other Passover uh, who can see it in the distance. So they can celebrate Passover at a second time, a different time, if there's an, an outlying area. And uh, that's just by special rules. And we're going to read, I'm going to read you the proof of that from a scholar, top scholar who wrote about that in a second. So I want to read you a letter I received so you can see my response and we'll look at the top scholar who talks about this. All right. So one John writes me and he asks me about this. Uh, can you clarify what the third pa Passover is supposed to be? I understand the second Passover if you cannot keep the first, but what is the third? Everything I found online said Jesus ministry was 3.5 years. Uh, also provide a hot link to that speech of Peter. Uh, so let me just re restate this again, because I don't think he had it clear in mind. There are in a single 12 month period, add one more day, you get two Passovers no matter what. So this idea that uh, we we will see there's three Passovers in the book of John, John 2 verse 13, John 6 verse 4, and John 12 verse 1. And the problem for these uh, scholars was, well, you know, there's three Passovers, there must be three years. And first of all, no, in a single 12 month and one day period, you're gonna have two Passovers. Now the question is, would you have a third Passover actually a, a, a second, excuse me, a second Passover every year as well. And so you could attend three Passovers in a single year and one day. Okay. And that's all it is. So, uh, and, and I'm not sure he got that clear. So I'm hoping that this will make it clear. Uh, now, and when it, when you see the evidence and the proof, it'll be make more sense what's going on here. So here's a top dog scholar, Ken Frank Doig, in his work uh, called New Testament Chronology, Lewiston, in New York, Edwin Mellon Press, 1990. And he provides an, ex date, an exact dating of the birth and crucifixion of Jesus and so on. Chapter 21, the two Passovers. So here's just going to explain matter-of-factly what's going on. He's, he's aware of the problem that people have, and they think it's three years or more. It's one year. And by the way, Matthew, Mark, and Luke make it clear it's one year. So, but scholars said it's three years with John. So they're doing that, I think, to deliberately make it look like the Gospels don't know what the heck they're talking about. And I, I mean the synoptics. But John is superior, of course, right? And so he is correcting the, the synoptics in there. That's a whole another thing to make John's Gospel be all about faith by mistranslating the word pisto 30 times as belief when it really means obey unto somebody. That's clearly in the NIV Theological Dictionary, page 1027. I have it memorized. Just putting a footnote as a digression there, but anyway, the, the a, there's always this game being played to make the the, the the synoptics, the three gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, to be inferior to John, so that you can have this idea that a superseding message came from John to replace and change everything you could see and read and understand from Jesus in the first three. This is just all a a game that's being played with you, unfortunately. But that's this is part of the game. And I'm going to, that's why I studied this issue to break this game up. So let's listen to what he has to say. Matthew, Mark, and Luke said that the Last Supper was the Passover meal and that Jesus was crucified the following day. John appears to have said that Jesus was crucified before the Passover. Can this seem inconsistency be reconciled? There are solutions that allow the wording of all four Gospels to be exact and also clues to the year of Jesus' crucifixion. One solution recognizes that many Jews of the diaspora observed two days of Passover. The pilgrims may have brought this second day of Passover to Jerusalem, and John is referring to that second observance. A second solution recognizes the different calendars in use in Jerusalem, where a sunrise reckoning or sunset reckoning might cause the Passover to fall on different days. A third sees the Last Supper as an observation of Passover according to the solar jubilee calendar of the Essenes, and John's Passover according to the lunar sunset calendar. The last possible solution recognizes that the Passover was a figure of speech that included all the week of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So he's giving you all kinds of explanations of why that particular issue is brought up against, allegedly, the validity of Jesus being crucified before the Passover or on the Passover and so on. And he he's going to settle it very clearly that he's he's crucified on the evens. Okay. That means between both days anyway, but that's a different issue. I don't deal with the Passover crucifixion timing precisely, but that, that this article, which was not intended to fix the, uh, the one, the one year versus three year estimate provides me the evidence I need to tell you, oh, there is two Passovers in a single season as he'll also relate. So let's, he calls it the two diaspora Passover. All right. So let's read this section a little bit. 
uh, and we're not going to read all this, just so you know. The observance of double holidays in the diaspora became necessary because the Israelite distant Israelites distant from Jerusalem did not know when the Sanhedrin officially declared Rosh Kodesh, or the new month. This was particularly important for Rosh Kodesh Tishri, which set the date to the Day of Atonement and Feast of Tabernacles, and Rosh Kodesh Nisan for the following Passover. Pause. So it's very important in Judaism to do calendars setting of holidays by declaring the new moon. And that would be done from the Sanhedrin at Jerusalem. By the way, in Colossians and Paul mocks, no Galatians, when Paul mocks the Galatians for observing days, new moons, etc., he is mocking this whole procedure of setting calendar dates and following any kind of holidays. And he's saying, why do you want to be subject to the, you foolish Galatians, why are you doing this again? You, you're free from the law. That's the law's bondage, and you you are freed from it. So why do you want to be in bondage to the weak and beggarly angels who gave you the law in the first place? The Torah, which he says in Galatians three nineteen, was given not by God Yahweh. Was good, the Torah was given by the angels through a mediator Moses, and then he calls them weak and beggarly celestial beings in Galatians four nine, according to Vincent's translation of that word that's translated as elements, really meaning elemental spirits of the the control of the wind, fire, and water in Greek thinking in the Greek term elements meant that in Greek thought, celestial beings. Anyway, so uh, that that's important to see that word new month. And this gives you some dynamic of what what Paul is putting down as I'm reading this. You just know what he mocks and denigrates is an absolute vital thing that happens every month in Judaism, just setting the resetting the ca calendar each month by the new moon. Okay, so this setting of the new month, this was particularly important for Rosh Kodesh Tishri, which sets the date of the Day of Atonement and Feast of Tabernacles and Rosh Kodesh Nisan for the following Passover. To ensure that these festivals were always observed on the proper day, they became observed on two successive days. This observance was only according to the sunset reckoning of the diaspora, meaning the people who were who had uh, left Israel and were living in maybe Greek, Roman areas or other places nearby maybe Arabia as well. The Pharisees of the Sanhedrin and the later sta sages who recorded the Mishnah and Talmud also used this calendar. So we get an idea now, he's saying, by looking at the Mishnah of a later time too. In the diaspora, the month of Adar would already have been established by observation or messengers. However, the official beginning of the following month of Nisan, that's when Passover is going to occur, was not known in advance. So you could not know that. You have to wait until close in time to know when it is. This left the problem of the official day of Passover and thus led to the double Passover. So now he's explaining to you why there's two days that are Passover. The Passover was observed in the evening followed the beginning of Nisan 15. The two days of Passover were observed on the 15th and 16th days following the 20 day, 29 day month or on the 14th or 15th days after a 30 day month. So you see there's variations of months as well. So this is why this can only be set at the last possible minute in order for people to know what to do. And what he's saying is the Jewish establishment, the Sanhedrin set two days. So for the very fact, this is, this can vary easily. And so just give people two days and we'll always be right <laughs> kind of thing, I think is what he's saying. Thus the official Passover meal was observed on Nisan 15 in either case. So the meal doesn't change. Okay. But the Passover celebration can be, different on a different day. You'll see. The true dates of the double Passover would have been Nisan 14 and 15 following an actual 30-day Adar and Nisan 15 and 16 following a 29-day Adar. Adar is the month prior to Nisan. The last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was also observed double and the festival was eight days long instead of seven since the Feast of Unleavened Bread had already begun the Last Supper. It, he gives citations. Can this be the basis of seeming second Passover referred to by John? All right. I'm going to leave it there because you get the picture. Is It's so complex. The people ca in control of the calendar decided, you know what? To make sure we're not going to be a mistake, we're going to use, we'll always use Nissan 15 because that's true in both the, the 29th or 30th month calendar. But because there's this other issue of when that is going to be advised to people, let's just create a second date for Passover and celebrate it on that day as well. Uh, and that made you, the, what I just told you is Nissan, you could have Nissan 14 be the extra date, or you could have Nissan 16 be the extra date, but each one would be another day of Passover. So that basically had a due date, two date festival. And this hill we discuss was uh, in, in effect in the Christian era as well. All right, so I think that helps explain uh, all we need to explain from this book, uh, New Testament 
chronology. There's lots of other interesting things to read, but uh, that's it. So I hope that in light of that, that the, uh, here's what I said. The Gospel of John mentions three Passovers, John 2, 13, John 6, verse 4, John 12, verse 1, which is how scholars long ago said Jesus' ministry is three years. This is immediately nonsense, for in one year there are always two Passovers in 12 months span, plus one day, given an added couple of days. But in that era of Jesus, the Sanhedrin rule provided two Passovers close in time each year. And that explains why you have three in the book of John, but you only have one calendar year plus extra some extra time in the three synoptics. And, um, you know, I could go through a whole lot of other issues, but I think that settles the point. And what I also tried to make the point was the validity of the Clementine homilies is established by things like this, this detail, a small detail, just in passing that it's a one year ministry that matches the synoptics, but doesn't go along with John. If you have this wrong reading, if you're not informed and you're not a contemporary that would know a contemporary would have known immediately that John isn't talking about uh, three years. <laughs> they would laugh at the, that, but a contemporary like Peter would know it's a one year period, a one year and a half period. So this is not a, uh, uh, this is a proof positive that this work is much more authentic than you might. It's not crafted by some con artist later. It is literally Peter speaking to us from the Clementine homilies that he was there. And that can verify his statement is legitimate. His statement is contemporary. And therefore, this is not a work that is corrupt at all from the perspective of the original of it. Of course, the only thing that's been changed by Rufin is apparently in this, in this passage, in fact, the name Simon Mangus doesn't appear in this particular chapter, but that is who he's been referring to. And that is the bogus aspect of what Rufinus does to try to create a cipher only. Only the people with the cipher would know what the words really meant. And that's how they would read it. But you and I have to then have, you know, have scholars go through it and go, yes, we can see it's it, it only fits Paul. I mean, you could just read it off the page and you know who he's talking about. All right. Anyway, uh, I hope that helps uh, everybody understand that why Peter did not advise Paul about the what he had heard. He clearly had heard it was a vision. I just want to repeat that again here. If then our Jesus appeared to you in a vision, made himself known to you and spoke to you, it was as one who was enraged with an adversary. And this is why it was through visions and dreams or through revelations that were from without that he spoke to you. He did not know of any physical appearance of Jesus to Paul. That was... That was never communicated by Paul to Peter. And we saw in the previous slide, a couple slides back, where Paul says in Acts 26 to King Agrippa, Oh, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. And that's not how we usually think of the word vision. We think of it as a vision in your mind. But he's using this word vision to apply to his claim of an appearance, a physical appearance of the resurrected Lord. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, just like all the Mary Magdalene saw the resurrected Christ, and then the 12, and then lastly myself, born out of time, I saw the resurrected Christ as myself. That's how we know he is claiming a physical return of Christ, on top of the fact that Luke adds these details of the other men heard the voice, saw the light. These are, means it's an extra mental uh, uh, event that Paul is allegedly experiencing. At least that's the way Paul is relaying this whole story. Of course, Luke doesn't actually have a firsthand account from the uh, men with him because their names are not ever given. So we don't have any uh, verification from an eyewitness who was with Paul, but that's beside the point. The point is that we know for a fact that that could not be the Lord Jesus because Jesus could not return. And the reason Peter, despite knowing, let's go back, the sign of the Son of Man prophecy, which we already showed you here in Acts 3, verse 19 to 21. Okay, so I hope that helps everybody to realize that the Clementine homilies have a lot of credibility just from that one little detail being able to be verified. I wanted to also make sure I'd answer John carefully and given him that information. And I will post for those of you who want to read more of the Clementine homilies, I'll post, post a link to it in the description to this video later. All right, God bless. Take care. Ciao. Bye.